So, GNOME 47, it's not as big a release as I expected because a lot of the Sovereign Tech Foundation projects haven't landed yet. But there's still quite a bit to talk about. From accent colors, much better Wayland support, improved looks, to performance improvements, and a lot of changes in the default apps. GNOME 47 will of course be the default in Ubuntu 24.10 and Fedora 41, which is the distro I used to test and record everything you will see here. So now let's move on to what you can expect in GNOME 47 and this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, your all-in-one platform to create, publish and manage your own website. Squarespace has really easy tools to make sure anyone can end up with a nice looking, well-optimized website, no matter if you know how to code or not. Squarespace has what they call their blueprint system, which lets you pick from a variety of templates that are pre-built and will suit any type of website. And they even have the SEO tools you need to make sure your website doesn't end up in the last page of Google's search results. To go further, Squarespace has their own design engine to create your own pages. You can just drag and drop elements where you want them and you can change the colors, the fonts and just tweak the template however you want. And then you can add some extra features like creating your own online shop with a complete payment system. You can design your own logo from Squarespace, book your own domain name. So click the link in the description below to give Squarespace a shot and you'll even get 10% off your first domain or website purchase. So of course we will begin with accent colors. Yes, it's frivolous, it's purely visual and virtually every other desktop has had it for a while now, but now GNOME has it as well, sort of. You can head over to the appearance settings and select one out of nine different colors for your GNOME. The implementation is basically a carbon copy visually of what Ubuntu had done themselves for a long while, but at least this is officially baked in. The color you picked is used for action buttons, for toggles, for radio buttons, for some link colors, and also in the GNOME shell for some buttons, quick settings, and selected items. Gnome is not necessarily a very colorful place. So for example, hovered items in menus are still the usual gray. Same goes for selecting folders or files in Nautilus. This won't change that color, nor will your folder icons change color either. Now this accent color is implemented following the settings portal standard. So technically apps made for other desktops will at least follow that color. And I'm saying technically here because for now, nothing I tested did follow that color at all. For example, in Fedora 41, the KDE apps I installed from the repos did not follow the color I set in GNOME, nor did KDE applications installed through Flatpak. Apps made for Mint, like Warpinator, using GTK but not Libadvita, also did not apply that color. Basically, in my testing, only GNOME apps followed it, but not all GNOME apps. GTK2 applications didn't grab the color, GTK3 applications also didn't and still use the older GNOME theme. Only Libadvita apps used it, which is most GNOME apps, but not all of them. Also, stuff like Firefox or LibreOffice don't follow it. And most annoyingly, no Libadvita app installed through Flatpak followed the accent color either. Applications that ship with their own accent color will also supersede the accent color you set, but this is intended. And I thought at least applications made for other desktops would respect that color because the settings portal has been implemented a while ago and KD at least should have support for these accent colors. I'm pretty sure they added it. From what I understand, all Libadvita apps will need to update to use the latest version of Libadvita as their base. They don't necessarily have a lot of code to change, but they do need to use the latest version of Libadvita. And at that point, all GNOME apps that use Libadvita, whether they shipped as flat packs or native packages or whatever else, they will work with accent colors. But the situation two days before release, as I'm recording this, is virtually nothing uses the accent color at all. Another visual change is for title bars. Apps using X11 or X Wayland will now get a Libadvita themed title bar, even if the app doesn't rely on client-side decorations. 
meaning that not only your title bars will look proper for non-Wayland apps, but they will also follow your dark mode or light mode, so that's pretty nice. There are also changes to some modal dialogues in the GNOME shell, like the restart and shutdown dialog, and in various places in applications and in the settings, for example the new folder dialog or the delete file dialog. These now have separated buttons instead of them being sort of inverted tabs located at the bottom of the dialog. It doesn't change the usability, it just looks nicer and it's more in line with the current GNOME style. Now this might sound like I'm pretty negative about GNOME's accent colors, but this was all implemented using a standard everyone agreed upon, so there is no reason why these accent colors wouldn't be used by other applications. It's probably just an implementation's detail, and I'm sure that by the time you get your hands on GNOME 47 in your distro of choice, all of this will be solved and applications will reliably use the color that you set, because Everything is plugged in everywhere, so there's no reason why this shouldn't work. So GNOME 47 is mostly a release that does a lot of stuff under the hood. First, it improves support for HDR. It's still all completely experimental, it's not at all on the level of what you will find in KDE, it would only work with a specific Vulkan extension, and you still have to run a convoluted command line to enable it, and then you have to run various HDR and Vulkan enabled apps using the command line as well. But it's progress. Of course, KDE still has a giant edge on HDR support, but at least GNOME is working on it, and now that the color management protocol is sort of stabilizing, I'm pretty sure this will go much faster. The window manager and the shell themselves are also now completely X11 independent, meaning distributions can decide to ship GNOME without any of X11's libraries. You don't need any of those to build GNOME anymore. Of course, this doesn't mean GNOME will stop supporting X11 anytime soon, but it does mean that distributions that don't want to ship with an X11 session can do so. Not a lot will, probably just Red Hat and Fedora to begin with, and then all distributions will just follow suit year after year. Probably 5 to 10 years X11 is dead, but you still have a lot of time to use it if you absolutely want to stick to it. Now, Wayland support improved as well, fortunately, with experimental support for the session management protocol, meaning windows will be able to be sized and positioned at their previous place when you experience a system crash or an issue, at least if you enable that experimental preference. But that will be for GNOME 48. The base work is in GNOME 47, but it's not enabled here. Matter, the compositor, will also now support the DRM lease protocol, which means VR headsets are now supported under Wayland in GNOME. And you can expect some performance improvements as well, notably for mouse cursor movements, which no longer require redrawing the portions of the screen where the cursor moves. It is drawn independently as a layer on top of the desktop. Using GNOME in headless mode, for example for remote desktop solutions, should also now perform much better and be much more stable, and x apps that have the ability to scale themselves for fractional scaling will now be able to do so instead of being scaled wholesale by the compositor, meaning some x apps will look way less blurry than they did if you use fractional scaling on Wayland. You will also have hardware accelerated screen recordings in GNOME using the default built-in tool, so better performance and better frame rates for these recordings. And Tracker and Tracker Miner, the indexation tools that power the shell's search, were renamed to Local Search and Tiny Sparkle to avoid the negative connotation of tracking. Now, in use, GNOME 47 does feel pretty smooth, pretty responsive, and pretty fast on real hardware and inside of a VM, but I haven't daily driven GNOME for a while now, so your mileage may vary. Now, as per the applications, you can also expect plenty of changes here. First, the file manager Nautilus gained a new sidebar. It works exactly as it did before, but it's reorganized with all system locations up top and all user shortcuts under it. Nautilus also now has a network view instead of having to navigate to the other locations zone to find it, it displays everything that is currently connected and the previous places you went to. Nautilus will also now be used as the file picker or save dialog inside of other apps, meaning this file picker instantly gained a lot of capabilities. First, it looks much better. Second, you get the same interface everywhere. 
Third, you can now rename and create folders in there, finally, and you get all the search, the sorting options and the view modes you would want, it's much better. It also means that every future improvement applied to Nautilus will also apply to the file picker or save dialog, which is really good, but not all GNOME apps seem to have made the move to support it. I would expect they have some code to change to make sure that they use this instead of the GTK file picker. Gnome Web or Epiphany now lets you automatically fill in fields inside of web pages so you can complete online forms a bit faster. And it now has a privacy report so you can know which websites are tracking you and what has been blocked automatically by Epiphany from those websites. Web also now lets you import passwords and bookmarks from CSVs, so it's a bit easier to use if you're migrating from another browser, but the extension support is still lackluster if non-existent, and it won't really let you use the tracker or ad blocker you want or the password manager of your choosing. The bookmarks interface also received some love, you get now a clear button in the address bar and you can turn off touch navigation gestures as in swiping left or right with two fingers to navigate back and forward. They unfortunately had to disable Firefox Sync from inside of Epiphany, meaning that you can no longer use your Firefox account to automatically import your passwords, your logins and your bookmarks, which severely reduces the integration of Epiphany with, for example, a smartphone. And in my opinion, Epiphany is still not really suitable for a day-to-day -day browser for most people. If you really want to, you can use it, but it's still plagued by not having any good extension support, and that's a major drawback, at least for me and for a lot of people, I think. Gnome Maps gained dark mode support in its styles, so the map is also dark now. And you can now see public transport icons on the map, if your city is supported. This did not happen for my city, Brest, unfortunately. The vector tiles are now the default as well, and they perform much better than the previous raster tiles, which have been retired. It also means that you can now click directly on any point of interest on the map. Gnome Calendar has seen a bit of work this time around with a reworked event details pop-up that will display a lock icon when an event is read-only. All the sections are now properly split with separators, the video links for meetings only appear in the meeting section now, not in the location section as well. Read-only calendars now can't be edited in the event editor dialog, obviously, and the add calendar dialog was also tweaked to be clear. They also fixed 50 different bugs in there, so the app should be in much better shape. Finally, the Disk Usage Analyzer now looks pretty good with a Libadvita makeover using newer components and symbolic icons. So quite a few changes here and some nice ones at that, especially for Nautilus and using Nautilus as the file picker. It makes sense to retain the exact same interface you use to navigate your files as the one that you would use to save them or pick them from any other app. It just shares the work and it's probably a good idea to do so. Now, as per the settings, there's not a lot here. There's a new modernized user ad dialog, which looks a bit better. A lot of pages were ported to newer Libadvita widgets for a nice, more modern look. You also gained a new option in the accessibility panel to activate windows when you're hovering your mouse cursor over them. It is now possible to preview keyboard layouts in the input sources dialog of the keyboard settings. And a few dialogues were also turned into sub pages, so there shouldn't be as many little windows popping up when navigating the settings. Online accounts now gain the ability to auto configure email accounts for IMAP and SMTP. Microsoft 365 accounts now support mail, calendar, and contacts. WebDAV has better auto config, and the desktop can now send you a notification when one of your accounts needs your attention to fix something, change the login or the password. On accessibility, the screen reader received a few improvements, notably paving the way for the better accessibility framework in Wayland. So, GNOME 47, it's not a lot of visual day-to-day -day features for users, 
but under the hood it paves the way for a much much better much more modern desktop from performance improvements to continued work on the global keyboard shortcuts portal to the experimental HDR support improved Wayland performance improved cursor performance the new Vulkan renderer that should speed things up using your GPU when playing back video the hardware enabled encoding for the built-in tool it's all back-end stuff that will make your experience faster smoother and much more resilient in the future now this does mean that for some users this will be a nothing release if you love x11 and you want to stick with it none of this will mean anything to you because you're not getting any of it until you move to wayland and if you're a wayland user but you don't really care about any of these things all you're getting is a few more features in the apps, accent colors that will take a bit of time to appear in every application, and a few visual tweaks to dialogues and the file picker. So there's not a lot for you here. In the end though, it's all based on my own expectations. I expected GNOME 47 and GNOME 48 to be the two major releases where the Sovereign Tech Foundation projects, the major revamps of GNOME systems would happen. Turns out it's probably going to be mostly GNOME 48 and GNOME 49 and GNOME 47 is still a transition release paving the way for all these nicer things to land. It's still a worthwhile upgrade, you're getting visual improvements, you're getting much better performance, so it's worth it, you should absolutely upgrade if you currently use GNOME 46, but it's not a major release by any stretch of the imagination. And now let's stretch the runtime of this video with this message from our sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. You all know about them by now. I've been talking about them at the end of my videos for more than two years, which shows how dedicated I am to showcasing their products. They're really good. They're computers that ship with Linux out of the box, laptops, desktops, you decide. They have a wide range of devices. You can configure most of the components inside. You can have your own custom keyboard layout, your own logo laser etched on your laptop, and they will basically fit every price point and every need. And you know that their computers run Linux really well because that's the point of the entire thing. I only use their devices these days. My entire channel, my podcast, my videos, everything is run from one of their laptops and all my gaming needs are served from one of their desktops. So if you need a new computer, you need to run Linux on it, and you want to support a company that actively contributes to Linux support for hardware, click the link in the description below and get yourself something from Tuxio. They're really, really good. Anyway, thank you all for listening. As always, you know what to do. All the YouTube buttons, click them all, make this video pop in the algorithm, make the channel grow, and make Linux grow as well. And if you really enjoy the channel, I probably have one of the cheapest Patreons or YouTube memberships for the amount of stuff you get, so check that out in the description as well. Thank you all for watching, and I guess you will see me in the next one. Bye!